What's your favorite carol, Tiny Tim? Do you know? Does your father manage to keep England's cynicism and oppression out of your home, out of your heart? Do you know the songs of the season? Do you know the Christmas carols or nursery rhymes or what do you sing that brings you hope? The nursery rhymes of England back when there were debtors' prisons, poor houses, and schools for street children were generally commentaries on the times, just like the story of Tiny Tim. Jack Spratt, who could eat no fat, is said to be one such political commentary. Rockabye Baby, even though it was written in the American colonies, was first published in England in the 18th century with the footnote, this may serve as a warning to the proud and ambitious who climb so high that they generally fall at last. Perhaps like Charles Dickens' own A Christmas Carol, it is best understood as a cautionary tale. But nursery rhymes aren't all that different from Christmas carols, are they? Stay with me on this one. While Ebenezer Scrooge may yell out his window to the cheery carolers below, carols aren't always all jingle all the way. We're not always up on a rooftop, click, click, click. Yes, you've got your hippopotamuses and mommy's kissing Santa and the two missing teeth and the really hateful song about the green hairy outcast. But honestly, a lot of the carols actually carry with them pleas for help or references to times of injustice. We sang this morning, then woe is me, poor child, for thee, and ever mourn and say, for thy parting neither say nor sing. Because in the bleak midwinter, references King Herod's narcissism and subsequent genocide of toddlers under two years old. During communion, we will sing in live church, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appear. O come, O come, cites the not as well known fall of Israel and Judah and the Israelites' subsequent exile as slaves to Babylon. Not refugees, y'all, but captives. Two weeks ago in church, we sang, Then Joseph flew in anger, in anger flew he. Let the father of the baby gather cherries for thee. Let the father of the baby gather cherries for thee. Of course, the cherry tree carol recalls Joseph's shunning of Mary when she told him the child wasn't his. Then there's sinners wrung with true repentance, doomed for guilt to endless pains. Justice now revokes the sentence. Mercy calls you, break your chains. Now, Angels from the Realms of Glory is the perfect carol for the dead old Marley confronting his former pal and partner Scrooge chapter of Dickens' novella. But alas, I doubt the carol is citing that. People, we are under attack. And art is a reflection of that. A Supreme Court justice actually joked this week, a Supreme Court justice, one of the highest justice jobs in the United States, one of the people we should be so honored as to have light our advent candle of justice. A Supreme Court justice actually joked this week about black children dressing up as Klan members to go visit Santa. 
And if that isn't offensive enough, that comment was somehow supposed to relate to the human rights violation of refusing services to LGBTQ couples. I will pause for a moment of expletives to run through your head, but hopefully not out your mouth. <laughs> Honestly, I'm sort of glad we're focusing on Tiny Tim this week for justice instead of Scrooge. The last thing this congregation, this city, this state, or this country needs is a middle-aged white man steeped in capitalism and greed, getting frightened by imaginary hell, changing his heart and his life to become the hero by paying his employees a livable wage, providing for their families, and keeping the poor, helpless, tiny Tim alive. I am over it. That level of life change doesn't happen in three nights. You can't fool me. I mean, I get it, rhetoric and storyline and stuff, but y'all, <laughs> people in America become nice to one another for a whole month because of an imaginary dude flying through the sky. But we can't care about the rise of Asian hate crime and anti-Semitism about drug addicts littering our streets with needles and recruiting children. We can't care about abused women high functioning or still trying to escape their abusers. We can't care about suicidal teens trying to survive in a cis world or refugees fleeing their hideous countries only to be put in cages in this one. We can't get motivated to care about these issues the other 11 months of the year. Dang, if a fat white guy with a beard can change us for a whole month, what could Jesus do with a whole lifetime? In the movie Mary Poppins, the most famous nanny talks the father, George Banks, into taking his children to work with him. Of course, all the while making him think it was his idea. As she prepares the children that night for an outing with their father, she sings the song, Feed the Birds, about a woman she knew they would see along the way. Of course, in the movie, the little child does see the woman sitting on the steps of St. Paul's and begs to exchange his tuppence for some crumbs to feed the birds. His father Box at the idea and they head into the bank where the bank manager, a hungry capitalist, grabs the coin from the little boy's hand. Chaos ensues with the children escaping into the dark streets of London where they are lost and scared and their father, summoned before his boss, loses his job. There's a short interview at the end of the soundtrack for Mary Poppins of the Sherman brothers who reminisce about creating the iconic songs for the film. Feed the Birds was one of the first songs the brothers wrote and the lyrics barely changed throughout the long course of creating the movie. For Richard and Robert Sherman, the song Feed the Birds, quote, encapsulated the idea of the film. The movie teaches the audience that, in the Sherman Brothers' words, it doesn't take very much to give that extra dimension, to give that extra love. Tuppence signifies little, hardly anything, and feeding the birds means giving to the people that need. In the plot line of the movie, it was the bank's children who were in need. They didn't just have to be provided for, they had to be loved. The other interesting part about this song is that the brothers describe Walt Disney as experiencing this sentiment so deeply. Fridays after work, Walt would invite the Shermans into the office to talk about the week at the studio or worldly events. And almost every time Walt would look at Dick and say, play it. The brothers knew he meant feed the birds. Sometimes Walt wouldn't even say anything. He'd just get misty-eyed and look out the window and 
You could tell by the look on his face that he wanted the song. There was rarely a Friday they didn't sing through the song in his office for him. What does it say that one of the most powerful, famous, influential, and wealthy men in the world wanted to be reminded weekly to feed the birds? To hear again that it takes so little to give people what they need. Fairness is one thing, justice is another. Rich children don't just need to be provided for, they need to be loved. Poor children won't survive on just love, they need provisions to stay alive. Justice is never just about equality or rights or fairness or right versus wrong. Justice is what happens in our hearts that then informs what happens in our lives. Justice is discernment. It is intuition. It is stepping back, assessing a situation, and finding where people are in need because of the blindness of others. Whew. That's a lot. But Mary got it. Did you listen to the Magnificat earlier? That song is a fist in the air and a pound on the chest from a poor female teenager living in an occupied country. Mary would have known her Bible, which included lamentations like this one in chapter two. My eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns. My bile is poured out onto the ground because of the destruction of my people. Because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city, they cry to their mothers, where is bread and wine? As they faint like the wounded in the streets of the city, as their life is poured out on their mother's bosoms. What can I say for you? To what compare you, O daughter Jerusalem? To what can I liken you, that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter Zion? For vast as the sea is your ruin, who can heal you? Sounds a little like some of the trauma we experience in America with the homeless, our queer community, refugees, and our black men. It also sounds a lot like the Dickens family's culture in England 200 years ago. And it sounds a lot like the Roman occupation of 2000 years ago. And so Mary sings out her battle cry of freedom when she discovers what she has been chosen to do. She speaks a word against the empire, against greed, against oppression, against corruption, against affluence. It's powerful if you really read it. And yet somehow we have reduced those verses to a song sung by a virgin dressed in blue. Again, y'all. Christmas is weird. But truth be told, we can call people bigoted or uneducated or selfish or blind or products of a system, but even the best of us have blind spots in our lives too. I mean, after Mary pulled her fist from the sky and put on her pink hat, she spent nine months doing the hard work of making a child. Then strangers and shepherds and astrologers came to visit him, bringing expensive gifts. And then she had to grab her child like the mother wolf she was and run to Egypt to protect him from genocide. But fast forward 30 or 33 years and even Mary missed the mark a time or two, the way the story goes. Even the best of us have blind spots in our lives. For example, we love to talk about the poor, oppressed, and needy, but we passed the same woman in a walker sitting on the corner asking for money on West Frederick at least three times a week, and we've never once put a PB&J in our car or a banana just in case we see her again. 
We love to talk about systemic racism on a national level or how wrong it is that police kill a grossly disproportionate number of black people for no reason. But have we actually examined how unconscious racism exists in our work offices, our Sunday school discussions, how it affects who we buy barbecue from, where we get our teeth cleaned, what plays our local theater chooses, where we choose to volunteer, even what color dog we adopt from a shelter? Whew, unconscious bias runs deep all the way to dogs. I know it's a lot to work on y'all, but if we don't work on ourselves, how can we ask others to? So before we start pointing fingers at idiotic, insensitive Supreme Court justices, don't tell anyone I actually said this. You may feel free to point away. But before we do that, let's do a little board, stick, eyeball, stone dropped, sin no mooring ourselves. In other words, if we aren't in therapy unpacking our own baggage, why do we expect Trump worshipers to be unpacking theirs? If we aren't doing self-reflection on what we missed as kids, a la Mary Poppins or a Christmas Carol, how can we identify how those experiences or messages affect how we treat others now as adults? If our economic status keeps us from living amongst the poor, the incarcerated, or the sick, then how can we use our wealth to work for long-term justice? If our social status prevents us from interacting with certain nationalities or people of a certain legality, then let's brainstorm how to create a more inclusive circle of friends. If gender fluidity is very confusing to you because of your age or biases or affluence, what if you hired a young person to gently mentor you to a place of understanding, appreciation, or even activism? It's okay to ask for help. And after you do, it's okay to start identifying which people aren't able to ask for help, which people may or may not be able to identify or articulate their own needs. The bank's children didn't just need to be provided for, they needed to be loved by their parents. Tiny Tim didn't just need a Christmas meal, he needed his dad to be paid fairly, he needed to receive health care, and his family needed charity if the gap between the two cake classes could not be reduced. Did you hear that? The gap between the two classes were not being reduced in England 200 years ago, so Dickens wrote a book about it. In America today, we've got two gaps, one small and one big. We've got the poor, and not far from them, we've got the middle class, and then we've got the upper 1.8%. There's a big argument about $400,000 in the government right now, if you've been following the news. Biden considers someone who makes $400,000 a year rich because it means that person is in the top 1.8% income bracket in the United States. The other 98.2% of 330 million people in the United States makes less than that, including me and possibly you. Formerly middle-class families can no longer have it all. They have to choose between providing for their children's college tuition or paying down a mortgage, between saving money versus paying for the rising costs of healthcare. Today, almost 40% of Americans would have to take on debt if confronted by an unexpected $400 expense. That's depressing. 
So let's go back to that mind-blowing $400,000 a year salary. Here's what else is astounding about this statistic. In that 1.8% of rich people in America, that median rich income bracket goes from $400,000 a year all the way up to $900,000 a year. And if you go to the tippy top of that 1.8%, those billionaires are making $19,000 a day, all the way up to $400 million a day. And I'm dead. Y'all, I mean, I should not have researched that. It makes me cranky. It also makes me selfish. Elizabeth Warren was right. Just tax the rich and America will really start to become fair. It's like my child says, I like all my toys. Why should I have to give away some of them to other kids who don't have any? Usually that makes my mom brain fume and my mom heart shrivel and die until I do something foolish like read the above statistic and suddenly I'm all Scroogey McScroogerton complaining that life isn't fair and yes, he should keep all five of his cat stuffies and the narwhal. But today's sermon is on justice, not fairness. And justice is something that must come from inside you. Like a baby gestating for nine months, it takes time to remember that you were taught hate. You were taught bigotry. You were taught greed and you were taught bad habits. It takes reading books and practicing justice and all that hard but good stuff to overcome what society has turned us into. Hear this word of justice. You were born beautiful and creative and free. And we've got to remember that and then work so hard to help others understand that too. Maybe that's why Christmas and the carols and the advent and the waiting and the mother's rally cry and the baby's newborn cry are so important. They remind us to find our hearts, remember the truth, muster the courage, recognize we will make mistakes, realize others will win, but stick to our hearts, stick to our truth, stick to our justice, born on some hay in a cave, to a low-income Middle Eastern girl in an occupied country. Jesus, what did Mary hum to you that night? Tiny Tim, what carols were you taught to sing? And to you beyond my screen, what songs remind you of sorrow? and then wake up the justice in your heart.